Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, I've heard a lot of good things about the program at Yale, so it's uh, really uh, an honor for me to be uh, with you this afternoon. And I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Humphreys for inviting me um, uh, to be here. So I will, um, and welcome to the group at U UConn, Chip. Um, be happy to um, uh, engage in any discussions um, later on as well. I'll be covering uh, sort of some aspects related to nutrition and infectious diseases in general. Um, fortunately, it's a wide field and increasingly there is more and more work that's being done in, in this area. So, um, but I'll try to cover um, some, uh, some part of that. Um, briefly, um, some on vitamin A and infection in general. Uh, a little bit on zinc uh, and diary and ARI particularly. Uh, some discussion about iron, particularly with relation to malaria. Um, uh, multivitamins and HIV AIDS, and then I'll end with some concluding remarks. Um, in terms of the distribution of nutritional problems, um, some of these slides may not be coming out as good as um, they were, but so I'll, I'll, I'll hopefully um, they'll be clear. Um, much of the distribution of nutritional problems, you'd find a map like this where this one shows um, children who are uh, moderately or severely stunted, uh, children who are underweight, uh, children who are wasted, and uh, the distribution of exclusive breastfeeding uh, in various uh, countries. And the trend seems to be always um, more or less the same, that a lot of the nutritional burden is in developing countries, and a lot of it is in sub-Saharan Africa uh, and South Asia. You know, large countries of uh, South Asia, particularly India, uh, Nepal, and, and, and others nearby, uh, and a large part of sub-Saharan Africa. Um, that would also be the same distribution for child mortality um, and morbidity. Uh, so uh, there are about close to eight or nine million deaths under the age of five every year. Uh, and a majority of these are uh, in sub-Saharan Africa and in uh, South Asia, as you can see by the density of the redness on the map. The question really is, um, is there a relationship between these two conditions, under nutrition on one, on one hand and morbidity and mortality uh, on the other? Some of the earlier studies looked at, um, in various studies really, these are a number of trials, and on the x-axis is the weight for age. Uh, and you see that as weight for age uh, got worse, uh, mortality was significantly higher. Um, that is in countries that range from uh, Bangladesh, Papua New Guinea, Tanzania, uh, and others. Um, if you look at that by uh, all causes mort of, of mortality, which is sort of the last row, um, you see that, um, as you'd expect with worsening of nutritional status, minus one to minus two standard deviations, minus two to minus three, or less than minus three, the relative risks tend to be significantly higher not only for all causes of death, but also for cause-specific mortality. Uh, diarrhea, uh, pneumonia, um, measles, um, and, um, and other infectious diseases. You would see that that's really um, not only for those who are minus two and lower, but even for those who are less, the sort of between minus one and minus two, which tends to be usually thought of as not as severely, uh, they are mildly undernourished. Uh, in many cases, the definition of wasting and stunting is below minus two. You'd find even those who are mildly undernourished, there still tends to be um, a significant increase in mortality. So it's really a spectrum uh, and, and a gradient that leads to uh, higher morbidity and mortality. Uh, the causes of death among children under the age of five are these. They are all known. Uh, it's thought that malnutrition contributes in a prominent way to uh, most of these uh, conditions. The range uh, is between 30 to 50 percent of deaths are possibly uh, related to undernutrition. And by implication that perhaps by intervening on the nutritional status of individuals, either by preventing malnutrition or um, treating malnutrition, that we can have an impact on reducing um, uh, childhood mortality. 
there is this cyclical relationship that uh, we're all familiar with where infectious disease leads to uh, an impairment of nutritional status through uh, a number of potential mechanisms, uh, reduced intake, uh, malabsorption, uh, increased losses, uh, increased catabolic processes as a result of the infectious disease. Uh, and in, in turn, sort of uh, the question out there that's more sort of frequently studied is, is nutrition having an impact on the incidence and severity uh, of infectious diseases? And um, given that there is this cyclical relationship and a vicious cycle that ends up in mortality in most cases, is there a way to intervene and interrupt the vicious cycle perhaps through uh, nutritional interventions? So we have looked at some of these uh, with respect to a number of uh, micronutrients. Um, these are the MDGs that uh, we're familiar with. Uh, the first one, uh, eradicating extreme hunger and uh, underweight, sort of the nutrition MDGs that is referred to sometimes. Uh, and MDG 4, 5, and 6 with a focus on child mortality, maternal mortality, and uh, infectious diseases. Um, and there is substantial evidence that there is an important role for nutrition uh, to address these various MDGs. And um, a, a movement by a number of organizations, uh, UN systems, World Bank, uh, academic institutions, to see that nutrition plays an important role in achieving the MDGs um, by 2015. So I'll start with vitamin A um, supplementation. Vitamin A deficiency uh, is prevalent uh, in much of Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. Uh, it's more severe in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. Some of it is still evident in Latin America, but perhaps not as severe. Um, uh, a number of trials uh, earlier on have looked at the role of vitamin A in measles, and perhaps that's one of the classic examples of uh, the importance of uh, nutritional interventions in the context of an infectious disease. Um, two trials in South, South Africa, one in Tanzania, and one in London as early as 1930, 32, uh, published in The Lancet, showing that vitamin A to individuals who are hospitalized with pneumonia tends to have a beneficial impact on mortality as well as morbidity. So that children who are hospitalized with measles uh, and given vitamin A tend to have less morbidity, less GI complications, less skin rash, less pneumonia, and less mortality as a result of um, the supplementation. And um, it is part of standard of care in many, or most settings, uh, developed or developing countries, uh, the US included, where uh, part of the management of measles is provision of uh, vitamin A supplementation. The question is, um, are there other infectious diseases or are other nutritional interventions that have as uh, clear an impact um, to reach that level of evidence and, and level of program uh, implementation? Um, that's what we uh, will talk about a little bit. Some of the evidence on vitamin A and, and other uh, conditions um, have been looked at. Uh, these are trials that looked at vitamin A in general mortality, all-cause mortality. Um, there are eight trials, but there are a few others that have been done after that. Essentially, children who are apparently healthy, uh, large numbers of them, um, uh, who have been randomized to zinc, uh, sorry, to vitamin A, or a control group, placebo in many cases. Uh, and um, this is a meta-analysis, essentially a relative risk of one is here, this vertical line. And anything to the left of the line suggests a beneficial impact of periodic vitamin A supplementation given every three to six months. Um, overall, um, showing a 23% reduction in children uh, mortality. Um, with uh, this periodic supplementation. These are supplements that are given periodically to children who are six months of age and older. Um, much of the evidence from these trials and others have led uh, many organizations to adopt vitamin A supplementation as uh, a child survival strategy. It is implemented in many countries, 70, 80 countries around the world as uh, an important tool to reduce uh, under five mortality. There is a little bit of controversy about um, vitamin A supplementation in the first six months of life. Um, uh, and uh, uh, there is much less evidence that vitamin A is beneficial uh, in that age group. Um, uh, 
there are efforts to piggyback it onto the EPI uh, schedule uh, without really much evidence that that is um, beneficial. Uh, more recently, there is greater controversy about neonatal vitamin A supplementation, giving it at birth and its potential impact on uh, infant mortality uh, with some mixed results, um, uh, some suggesting benefit in a few countries in Asia, a couple in Africa that suggest there is no benefit. And a large multi-center study is about to start, uh, commissioned by the Gates Foundation and uh, WHO uh, in three countries, Tanzania, India, and uh, Ghana. Um, and we are part of that effort. Um, and hopefully in a couple of years, we'll have some um, findings on that. On vitamin A, um, it has an impact on all-cause mortality, but also on diarrhea-specific mortality and measles mortality. This is the six months of age onwards. Um, there are some par paradoxical effects on whether vitamin A has a, 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 an impact, uh, possibly a negative impact on acute low respiratory infection. Um, uh, essentially, uh, more than one study suggested that uh, children who are six months of age and older who received vitamin A tended to have uh, higher incidence of fever or fever with rapid respiratory rate, uh, a composite of symptoms that suggest lower respiratory infection. Um, but uh, the reassuring part of, of, of uh, that is um, that there was no impact on uh, pneumonia-related mortality in many of the same trials that have reported uh, an adverse effect on morbidity. And um, some of the um, sort of the findings that are reported with uh, a higher occurrence of fever and respiratory inf uh, rate is sort of um, thought to be perhaps uh, more a manifestation of an improved inflammatory response that could be beneficial uh, to the baby. So uh, in spite of these paradoxical effects on acute low respiratory infection, uh, it is adopted as uh, a beneficial uh, intervention in most settings, particularly settings where there is vitamin A deficiency. Um, this is a trial from Tanzania that looked at vitamin A <coughs> um, among HIV negative and HIV positive kids some impact on um, height that was more evident among HIV positive uh, children. This is comparing the vitamin A to the placebo. Um, some impact on weight changes that's more evident among children who have had uh, a malaria episode, uh, but not among those who did not have uh, malaria. Essentially, um, suggesting that vitamin A uh, ameliorates the negative impact of infectious diseases on uh, height and weight uh, of children um, as one of the mechanisms through which it would uh, also uh, improve survival potential. This is one trial that looked at vitamin A and malaria in Papua New Guinea and again suggested a beneficial impact uh, on uh, malaria. Uh, vitamin A is one of the nutrients, as most of you know, that has been sort of mostly studied and there are um, tens of trials out there that looked at just vitamin A. So um, uh, a sample of uh, the findings uh, are what I have uh, presented today. So that's briefly on um, vitamin A. Some more work has been done on zinc. Um, zinc deficiency follows the same pattern of vitamin A deficiency in that uh, it is mostly in sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia where the diets are, are limited in, in zinc, uh, where uh, the source of zinc is mostly from plant sources and phytates and other ingredients in the diet are, are inhibitors of zinc uh, absorption uh, leading to a wide, um, widespread uh, uh, zinc deficiency in these populations. Um, zinc, like many other micronutrients, has been shown to be important for the uh, functionality of the immune system. Uh, there are many trials that have looked at that, many uh, observational studies, uh, human studies, as well as animal studies, essentially showing that most um, 
levels of the immune system, uh, cellular immunity and humoral immunity, uh, systemic or, or mucosal, uh, are affected by um, zinc deficiency. And um, a number of observational studies have noted that um, zinc deficiency is associated with a higher risk of morbidity uh, and mortality. And the question arose is whether zinc supplementation, therefore, has a beneficial impact on these outcomes. So these are trials that have looked at um, zinc um, among children with respect to incidence and prevalence of diarrhea. So on the left it's incidence, on the right are, are prevalence in various trials, uh, Jamaica, Guatemala, Vietnam, uh, and, and, and so on, with a pooled benefit, uh, pooled effect size of about a 25 uh, or 20, 20 to 25 percent reduction in the risk of um, diarrheal disease uh, among children. Other trials have looked at um, different types of um, sort of interventions for both diarrhea and pneumonia. Uh, the variety of trials examined really different interventions, um, either giving it to people who have an acute episode of disease. Uh, and looking at the recovery from diarrhea or respiratory infection um, and found a beneficial impact. Uh, others have looked at uh, children who are apparently healthy uh, and examined whether there is an, an impact on the incidence uh, and severity of new episodes. Um, and others have given short courses versus a continuous uh, long, long course. Um, from the variety of studies that have been done, um, there tends to be um, enough evidence that um, zinc is important in the management of diarrhea. It has been adopted as um, part of uh, the WHO guidelines for uh, management of diarrheal disease. Uh, zinc ORS is part of uh, practice. It's being uh, disseminated as widely as possible and there are a number of operational research studies that are ongoing to, to see how that could be uh, put into practice. Um, with respect to pneumonia, um, the evidence is a little bit not as strong. There are uh, two or three trials that are ongoing um, uh, in Bangladesh and uh, Ecuador and a couple other places looking at children with pneumonia and whether provision of zinc supplements versus placebo has a beneficial uh, impact there. Um, these various studies have also looked at zinc and growth. And this is uh, sort of zero growth uh, height changes comparing uh, zinc versus placebo. Uh, and overall, uh, you can see sort of a uh, range of potential uh, effect sizes. Um, when you pool them, there was a net beneficial impact uh, with respect to linear growth. And similarly, with respect to uh, weight gain uh, over um, the various trials. One study, a uh, couple of studies have looked at um, zinc supplementation on mortality. In the, in the sort of um, the evidence in the nutrition uh, community, in the international nutrition community, seems to always want uh, um, sort of an impact on survival as the strongest line of evidence, perhaps a carryover from the work of vitamin A, where a number of studies have been done um, to look at uh, mortality specifically, large enough to have an impact on mortality. So um, a couple of trials were done on zinc to examine the impact on mortality. One was in uh, Pemba, uh, Tanzania. It was about 20,000 uh, children who received zinc and uh, another 20,000 who received placebo. And overall, there was no impact on mortality, um, sort of uh, relative risk of 0.93, which wasn't significant. Stratifying by age, uh, there was an impact among children who were uh, older than one year of age, um, but not uh, among infants. The evidence with respect to a m large impact on mortality uh, is not there uh, as much as it is much clearer uh, in the case of management of diarrheal disease. Um, moving on to 
some of the work on um, iron. <clears throat> so this is uh, the distribution of anemia. And perhaps uh, anemia is um, the most common nutritional problem um, worldwide. Uh, it's common in developed settings as well as uh, in developing countries. <coughs> Severity tends to be greater in developing countries. Um, again, Sub-Saharan Africa and Asia and parts of, of uh, Latin America. But it is not uh, uncommon even in the US uh, among particular uh, groups. It tends to be uh, milder uh, in these populations. Um, malaria is one factor or one uh, sort of cause of uh, anemia in many of these settings, uh, particularly in settings where malaria is endemic. Uh, particularly in Africa. But it's really only one factor. Um, we tend to think of um, uh, iron deficiency uh, as a problem, and it is a problem. Um, but it's not the only problem. Um, uh, there are other nutritional problems that contribute to anemia. Uh, vitamins, uh, B vitamins. Um, uh, vitamin A has a role in, in the prevention of anemia. Uh, if you look at the interaction between vitamin A and zinc, uh, there is an important interaction there. Um, there are some negative interactions between zinc and iron uh, that would be important to think about in the context of the nutritional etiology of, of anemia. And then there are infectious diseases, uh, schistosoma, um, sort of hookworm and other parasitic infections uh, that are important in the etiology of uh, anemia, uh, either through blood, blood loss or uh, other sort of manifestations of uh, loss of appetite or, or other um, uh, factors that contribute to uh, anemia. And then there is uh, sickle cell disease, which is much more common in particular populations uh, than uh, in others. But not all anemia is iron deficiency anemia, uh, as is sort of commonly uh, thought of. Um, with that in mind, what's the influence of iron supplementation? Um, and, and there are, there has been uh, controversy on sort of is iron supplementation good or bad? Um, and it gets complicated with malaria particularly. So one of the earlier studies um, was a study, uh, there are many, but this is one of the earlier ones among Somali nomads uh, who were um, being managed for famine. Uh, and with the introduction of nutritional interventions, um, uh, including iron supplements, they noted, the investigators noted that there was an increased occurrence of malaria. Um, a study in Papua New Guinea suggested that iron supplementation uh, led to um, uh, an increase in parasite uh, density and morbidity um, in that setting. More recent work in Tanzania and Zanzibar did not find that impact, but the controversy has been on and off for a long time. Is, is iron supplementation contributing to uh, the occurrence of uh, malaria, or is it not? Um, uh, are iron supplements beneficial? Um, so a number of trials have looked at that, um, where iron was given versus placebo. Um, come back to the summary in a second. But these are some of the studies, essentially, that examined hemoglobin levels. Many of these settings have anemia. And so presumably, iron supplementation would be beneficial. And indeed, it was. If you look at, so this is, again, uh, hemoglobin levels and zero is no impact. Anything to the right suggests an, an impact, a positive impact, a protective impact uh, in, in hemoglobin levels. Um, the range is in, in, in size, but in most cases is beneficial with a pooled estimate that is uh, overall uh, significant, uh, 1.2, um, uh, that is uh, statistically um, significant. Um, if you look at um, the risk of anemia uh, as a categorical variable, I believe, I don't remember exactly uh, definition of perhaps less than 11, may maybe the definition, 11 grams per deciliter, about a 50% reduction in the risk 
Uh, well, severe anemia would be would be we wouldn't be 11; would be 8.5 or 7. Uh, we can go back to that. To that to the paper. So a significant reduction of 50% uh, in the risk of severe anemia with um, uh, iron supplementation. But was it also associated with um, malaria? And in many of these studies, uh, they have examined that question. There was um, a borderline impact in parasitemia in these studies, so iron supplementation was associated with um, about a 9% increase in the risk of uh, clinical, clinical malaria, uh, clinical with a positive blood slide, and uh, about a 17% uh, increase in the risk of parasitemia uh, without uh, necessarily a clinical outcome. So some of the conclusions from that, uh, there were 13 trials. Um, that have been sort of carried out in various settings, Ethiopia, Tanzania, and Papua New Guinea, and others. Um, uh, various uh, dosing regimens were used. Only one was uh, um, intramuscular, um, uh, parenteral, uh, intramuscular. Uh, uh, most of them were, uh, almost all of them were iron supplements. Um, and by and large, um, a significant impact uh, noted on uh, the risk of anemia and um, uh, severe anemia uh, with uh, an adverse effect on um, plasmodium falciparum. Um, so this is the conclusion that came out of the paper. Uh, the investigators noted moderate increases in some uh, malariometric uh, indices. However, there were improvements in hematological status that were very clear and significant. There's no evidence of exacerbation of uh, malariometric indices for doses of 10 milligrams per day in preschool children. And that really um, led to a continuation of current practices at that time that um, iron supplementation makes a lot of sense in settings where there is a lot of anemia. The concerns about malaria do not seem to be um, big, uh, and uh, the benefits are clear. Until a trial was done uh, in Pemba, Tanzania, um, that looked at routine iron supplementation um, to children. Um, this was a factorial design study that compared uh, really four regimens, but for the purposes of the iron question, uh, they examined iron compared to a group that did not receive iron. Um, iron was 12.5 milligrams, as you can see, um, uh, was placebo controlled. And um, half the doses were given to children who were uh, infants. The trial ended by the DSMB because of increased hospitalizations and death in the groups receiving iron. Some of the findings, iron supplementation was associated with a significant increase in admission to hospital, uh, an increase in mortality, it was a borderline significance and uh, uh, largely, quite possibly, uh, an issue of statistical power uh, and a significant increase in the composite endpoint of admission uh, or uh, death, which was a severe adverse event in that particular study. It was a large study, uh, well conducted, well analyzed, it took a long time for it to be um, sort of vetted and, and checked the data, was checked and rechecked many times uh, with support of WHO and the investigators and the findings um, stood. Um, these are uh, th their uh, findings from the paper that was published in The Lancet, essentially showing the same uh, uh, impact, uh, a significant increase in uh, mortality um, or hospital admission in the iron group. That um, led to uh, a revision of the guidelines, um, uh, which uh, was one of the slides I in inadvertently cut out. <laughs> Essentially, uh, WHO came out with the revised guidelines. The guidelines said previously that it makes a lot of sense to give routine iron supplementation to children in settings where uh, iron deficiency uh, anemia is prevalent. The new guidelines said something like, caution should be exercised in settings where the prevalence of malaria and other infectious diseases are high. Um, 
well, most settings uh, that I know of have high prevalence of malaria and infectious diseases. Um, and it, was, it wasn't clear really what this caution needs to be exercised um, mean practically on the ground. Um, one approach is it continues, it is advised that iron folic acid supplementation be targeted to those who are anemic, anemic or at risk of iron deficiency. And the implication of that is sort of um, screening program, which is expensive uh, and <coughs> logistically challenging uh, in many settings, particularly in, in rural settings. Um, and so uh, practically what's happening probably is um, uh, in settings where there is uh, malaria intervention programs in place, uh, these concerns might be less likely. Um, some of the work actually from the same paper, if you go back, uh, you notice that um, the evidence of harm was more clear among those who are iron sufficient and not among those who are iron deficient. So in the same population, there are individuals who are iron deficient who benefited from the supplementation and in programs that would be expected to be the case. So wherever there is evidence of iron deficiency, there is no question that iron supplementation is beneficial. In instances where they are not deficient, um, it's where concern uh, needs to be um, uh, to be there and caution needs to be exercised. One of the questions really um, that is out there as a result of this trial is um, what are the implications for pregnant women in many of the same settings where iron supplementation is standard of care. It's part of standard prenatal care. Um, and whether similar concerns should be uh, had about the potential con uh, sort of risks of iron supplementation uh, in those settings. There is a trial that's about to start in Dar es Salaam uh, with our group that will look at that and hopefully have some answers in the next um, couple of years. Moving on to um, HIV as the third infectious disease that, um, or the next infectious disease we can look at. Um, about uh, a majority of HIV infected individuals live in sub-Saharan Africa. Out of the 30 million plus, uh, more than close to 70% are in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, disproportionate to the number of people who live in that part of the world. Uh, it is a, a problem that is expanding in uh, South Asia uh, as well. Um, in Sub-Saharan Africa, it tends to be more, uh, as I guess everybody in Syria knows uh, everything about HIV. Um, I, I don't need to go into that. Um, but uh, and has its impact on the life expectancy, um, sort of, uh, sort of leading to a dip in in life expectancy anticipated as a result of the epidemic. And some of these. Um, sort of earlier expectations uh, uh, and sort of there are modeling exercises that went further out into the future. Hopefully that is being um, sort of uh, reversed, so to speak, or slowed down by the more um, widespread uh, availability of treatment, which is still far from desirable, but still much better than what used to be the case. If you, if you look at the cyclical relationship between infection and HIV infection and, and nutritional status in this case, um, it's evident one of the um, issues is uh, limited availability of food. Uh, uh, HIV impacts the most productive sector of society, including farmers and, and others. So there is food security problems in many countries where uh, HIV is prevalent. Um, it's evident that HIV leads to wasting and it used to be known as slim disease in the earlier parts of the epidemic. So um, there is less um, debate perhaps about how HIV leads to malnutrition through insecurity, food insecurity, and through various catabolic and, and, and uh, uh, other processes, malabsorption. Um, but um, whether um, nutrition has a role to play in the treatment and prevention of HIV is something that um, has been looked at and uh, we have looked at and I'll share some of the findings. But the, the natural sort of uh, immediate um, 
sort of hypothesis that comes to mind based on the coexistence of HIV and malnutrition in many of the same countries. Um, the ecologic uh, relationship that uh, is from the coexistence, the, the fact that protein energy malnutrition and AIDS have many common uh, manifestations, uh, reactivation of opportunistic infections such as TB, um, similar immune deficiency uh, syndromes, whether it's nutritional immune deficiency or HIV related. Uh, provided some of the reasoning for uh, looking more closely at uh, whether nutrition has a role to play in um, HIV care and treatment. So one of the earlier observational studies was this one done by uh, Richard Semba and colleagues at Hopkins and Malawi, where they looked at vertical transmission of HIV as it relates to, on the y-axis, serum vitamin A. And they found a very nice dose-response relationship. Uh, the higher the vitamin A, the lower the risk of mother to child transmission. Um, and reasonably speculated that vitamin A could be important for uh, preventing mother to child transmission. A number of other uh, studies supported that. Uh, study in, in Kenya that found a similar dose response relationship with shedding of the virus in breast milk or shedding of the virus in lower genital tracts that suggest uh, you know, how that could lead to a higher transmission uh, through the two mechanisms or through the two routes. There is biological plausibility. Uh, vitamin A is important for immune function. Um, uh, there is a nice dose response relationship. Uh, it's, it's a strong uh, relative risk. Um, so a number of trials were done to look at that, and this is one study that we have done in Tanzania among pregnant women, about 1,000 pregnant women who were enrolled in a factorial design study with vitamin A or placebo, and each group re-randomized to multivitamins or placebo. Um, essentially, um, having four groups, vitamin A alone, uh, multivitamins alone, which was B, complex C, and E, a group that received both, and number four was a placebo. And in a factorial design, we compared those two groups that received vitamin A to the two that did not receive vitamin A, and similarly for the multivitamins. So the multivitamins B, C, and E, without A, B, C, and E, compared to placebo, had beneficial impact on um, fetal loss, about a 40% reduction, um, uh, and about a similar magnitude in the impact on miscarriage and stillbirth, which wasn't significant, um, but about the same magnitude. Uh, fetal death was the composite endpoint with higher statistical power to examine that. Um, multivitamins also had a beneficial impact on low birth weight, about a 40% reduction, uh, as well as in um, severe preterm birth and um, small for gestational age. If you look at that, uh, it's the same finding, which is not very clear, the red. Um, uh, it's essentially the same finding. Uh, this vertical line is a relative risk of one uh, with beneficial impact um, for small for gestational age uh, and low birth weight and fetal death for the multivitamins compared to the no multivitamins. For vitamin A, there was no impact uh, on any of these uh, outcomes, vitamin A compared to no vitamin A. If you look at um, the multivitamins with respect to child HIV transmission, uh, again, uh, by and large, no effect um, on any of these outcomes. <coughs> but when you look at vitamin A and its relationship with uh, transmission uh, of the virus, um, there was, I don't know if you can, can you see the slide? Can you see any of the, of the horizontal lines? Um, so, uh, so it's a relative risk of one. Um, this is uh, total HIV transmission through the three routes. There was uh, a 39% higher risk of transmission that was significant, uh, relative risks not encompassing one uh, for total HIV transmission. About the same magnitude for transmission through breastfeeding um, as a result of uh, vitamin A supplementation. These are the same findings, uh, perhaps uh, in numbers, about 38% uh, higher risk of transmission that was significant, um, which wasn't the hypothesis that we set out to look at. 
the hypothesis was more coming out of the Malawi study that vitamin A is beneficial for various biological uh, reasons. Um, a lot of excitement about vitamin A with respect to child survival in many trials prior to that that supported the potential benefit of vitamin A in the context of HIV as well. Um, but that's not uh, what was uh, found after a lot of checking and counter-checking of the data uh, as well. Um, in retrospect, um, there are other studies that um, perhaps raise concerns about vitamin A in the context of HIV. Um, and happy to discuss more uh, if time allows. But this is one uh, in the, um, this is Alice Tang and her colleagues. Um, this was the MAX cohort, the multi-centered AIDS cohort study in the US um, that enrolled um, uh, homosexual and bisexual men in the US, HIV positive, and followed them up over time to look at time to AIDS um, and assess their dietary intake of vitamin A or other nutrients. Um, and found with respect to vitamin A, uh, these are the tertiles of vitamin A intake. Uh, this is the second tertile. Individuals who are in the first and third tertile of vitamin A intake tended to have worse outcomes compared to those who were in the middle tertile, suggesting a, a U-shaped relationship that um, perhaps uh, hasn't been looked at carefully um, at that time, that not only low intake uh, was problematic, but perhaps higher intake of vitamin A uh, might be problematic. And there are a number of uh, observational studies and, and in vitro studies that raise concerns about uh, vitamin A in that context, in the context of HIV. Um, with respect to multivitamins, um, there was no impact of multivitamins on um, transmission overall, um, as I have shown you in an earlier slide. But when you look at modifiers of uh, the relationship, um, and you stratify by lymphocyte count, so uh, look at stratifying by low lymphocyte versus high lymphocyte, those who had maternal lymphocyte count, uh, mothers who had low lymphocyte count and received multivitamins had about a 60% reduction in the risk of transmission compared to those who did not receive multivitamins. Uh, women with um, high lymphocyte count did not benefit. And this is the P for interaction. Um, similarly, women who had low hemoglobin, who had high ESR, uh, suggestive of an advanced disease stage, and babies who were born with a low birth weight tended to have a beneficial impact if their mothers received the supplements. And the mothers received the supplements during pregnancy but continued to receive it uh, in the period after uh, delivery. Uh, for as long as the trial continued, which was on average about uh, five years uh, after uh, delivery, during which the children uh, were breastfeeding. So um, possibly um, enhancing maternal immune function, uh, improving quality of life for the mother, uh, improving the quality of breast milk that the babies were receiving um, could have had uh, an impact on the transmission question. We looked at um, multivitamins in our trial and in other studies uh, and how they relate to disease progression, sort of separate from transmission mother to child. And the same um, MAX cohort found a beneficial impact of uh, multivitamins um, as well as individual vitamins on um, mortality, um, particularly B vitamins, uh, when they are taken in multiples uh, of the RDA, about a 40% reduction in mortality among those who had higher levels of intake of B vitamins compared to those who had low levels. A similar study from a, study, uh, uh, a population in South Africa, in Johannesburg, um, regular use of B vitamins, an observational study, was beneficial. Um, a small trial uh, that looked at 50 individuals with high doses of vitamin C and E and found an improvement in C and E levels, as you would expect, but uh, a trend towards reduced viral load um, in those who received uh, C and E. A trial in Thailand, uh, and this, these are published studies, uh, all the studies that, that I'm quoting, um, found a beneficial impact of multivitamins, um, particularly among those who had low CD4 cell counts, CD4 less than 200, 
a relative risk of 0.37 um, compared to those who received uh, a placebo. Uh, and in the same Tanzania study, um, uh, comparing uh, the four arms, really, those who received B, C, and E compared to placebo, uh, had about a 30% reduction in uh, mortality or progression to stage four. The majority of uh, individuals were in stage one at enrollment. Uh, and with that, um, there was about a 30% reduction in progression to stage four or mortality. These are the Kaplan-Meier curves from the same study. Um, and in the same study, um, a significant benefit with multivitamins on um, various uh, sort of signs and uh, conditions associated with HIV disease progression, uh, gingival erythema, oral ulcers, um, uh, nausea, vomiting, a number of GI uh, manifestations of advanced HIV disease that were significantly reduced with multivitamins. Uh, with respect to vitamin A, there was no uh, benefit on either uh, mortality or uh, morbidity. Um, there was a significant improvement in CD4 um, cell counts uh, with multivitamins and a reduction in the risk of wasting uh, as well. In the same study, um, there were beneficial impacts um, on child outcomes as well. So um, children who were born to mothers who received multivitamins had better uh, hemoglobin levels, reduced risks of anemia, better uh, motor development, better growth, and, and less morbidity uh, over uh, the period of the first two years of life. Um, I have a few more slides, but they would be showing many of the same, and maybe I should stop here um, rather than keep, keep uh, showing more slides to see if you have any questions. Thank you very much.